Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank the organizers for the uh, invitation. So I will speak about uh, Patagonia Keller manifolds. So I think it, uh, most of you probably already know what is a Patagonia Keller manifold. And let's have a shortly record the definition in a moment and uh, report about some recent advance in the study of such manifolds. So here's the uh, definition for completeness. So a Riemannian manifold is called uh, quaternionic Kähler uh, if it's uh, endowed uh, with a parallel skew symmetric quaternionic structure. Uh, at least this is the definition in uh, dimensions different from four. In dimension four, uh, this condition is too weak because it just implies the orientability of the manifold. And for that reason, uh, one needs to ask more. And so this is a four dimensional case in four dimensions, uh, quaternionic Keller ju just means half conformally flat Einstein. So this is the uh, setting in which we will work. And uh, you see here, I have already assumed that the scalar curvature is not zero. So it's of course a question of terminology, whether you want to separate hyper Keller uh, manifolds from quaternionic Keller uh, ones. So here I'm separating them. I will only speak about this case of uh, non-zero scalar curvature. And when I mean hyperkähler manifolds, I will explicitly uh, mention them as hyperkähler uh, manifolds. Okay, so uh, some basic facts about quaternionic Kähler manifolds are that they are Einstein. So they solve the Riemannian version of the Einstein equation with a non-zero cosmological constant. And the holonomy group uh, in the sense of Riemannian geometry uh, is uh, always a subgroup of SP1 times SPN. So as you all know, uh, Marcel Berger classified the uh, holonomy groups uh, of Riemannian manifolds by considering basically the irreducible case and then separating the case of locally symmetric uh, spaces from uh, or space of uh, symmetric spaces from uh, the case of non-symmetric uh, spaces. And in the end, you obtain a very short list of possible uh, holonomy groups of non symmetric, say, complete, simply connected Riemannian manifolds. And this is one of the groups uh, which appears. And so it deserves our attention because every group in this very short list uh, is one of the basic uh, groups in a Riemannian uh, geometry and should be studied uh, in detail. So some uh, facts which we know by now uh, on this. So Marcel Berger's classification was in the 50s. And at that time, it was not even known uh, whether there exist uh, non-symmetric quaternionic Kähler uh, manifolds, but now we know a lot about them. In particular, we know that uh, for positive scalar curvature up to homothety uh, in every dimension, there are only finitely many uh, such manifolds. This is a result due to Lebrun and Salomon, uh, which led them to conjecture that for positive scalar curvature, a quaternion, complete quaternionic Kähler manifold is automatically symmet symmetric. So this is a big uh, open problem in, in this uh, area, which I'm not solving uh, today, but I would at least uh, like to mention it. And uh, for negative scalar curvature, the, the situation is quite different. So in, for that setting, uh, it, it has not been conjectured uh, that the only uh, examples are symmetric spaces. In fact, the symmetric spaces in that setting are non-compact, uh, but you can consider quotients uh, of non-compact symmetric spaces which become compact. Uh, quaternionic Kähler, but they are still locally symmetric. And the, the first non locally symmetric examples were constructed in 75 by Alexeyevsky. And there are many more uh, examples which were found uh, later. So today I would uh, like to concentrate on the following uh, problem. So uh, we consider uh, quatern complete quaternionic Kähler manifolds, and we are interested in knowing uh, whether there are non locally symmetric examples uh, of a finite volume, or uh, if we cannot manage to produce finite volume, then at least we would like to study the existence of ends uh, of finite volume. That uh, would be nice. And uh, so to appreciate this problem, you should compare with the other groups in Berger's list. So for all the other groups in Berger's list, this problem is solved. And we even know compact examples, which are not locally symmetric and have uh, any of the groups in Berger's list as the holonomy group. In fact, these uh, constructions are attached to very famous 
uh, mathematicians, in particular Yao, uh, who solved the Calabi conjecture and uh, in this way uh, obtained the existence of compact uh, rich and flat uh, Kähler manifolds, and also Bouville, who studied the hyperkähler case, which is a something special case of the Calabi Yao uh, manifolds, and then Joyce, who solved the, this problem for the exceptional uh, cases, uh, cases of G2 holonomy and spin seven. Uh, holonomy. So the only open case until today is the case of SP1 times SPN. Okay, so this is a question again. Uh, do there exist a non locally symmetric complete quaternionic Keller manifolds of finite volume or at least with, uh, with an end of finite volume? Okay, so we uh, have an idea for how to construct such examples, and in fact, you will see in the end that it is successful, at least in some dimensions, all uh, of these uh, steps can be done. And uh, in arbitrary dimensions, it will at least give interesting complete quaternion Keller manifolds with uh, rather non-trivial fundamental groups. Uh, but in general, these spaces will be non-compact and only in low dimensions, we get uh, examples with, which have uh, uh, ends. So uh, I mean, maybe I should shortly say, uh, what is an end? At least give you a picture. So here's an example of a manifold with uh, three, uh, three ends. So I, we should think of this continuing to infinity and also here and, the, and there. So this is an example of a manifold uh, with three ends, so you see that these cross sections here they are compact, and we will see examples uh, later where we can indeed construct such uh, ends. And uh, then the question will be uh, what we can say about the volume. But there will be also other examples where these cross sections will not be compact but just of finite volume. So this is something which we can construct in all dimensions uh, finite volume uh, cross sections. Okay, so the idea is to just start with a symmetric space. So we know uh, very well the symmetric spaces. So let us start with a, a symmetric space of non compact type. So it will be dual to symmetric space of compact type. And of course, we assume it's quaternionic Kähler. These spaces are all known in, since Catan's uh, time, and they have been uh, systematically uh, studied by Wolf. So in, in the case of positive scalar curvature, they're also known as Wolf. Uh, spaces and it's known that uh, by results of Borel there always exists a uh, lattice in the full isometry group of these spaces such that the quotient is compact so we can obtain compact examples in this way but these are exactly the these locally symmetric examples uh, which I mentioned okay so this is the starting point point. Uh, then uh, what we do is uh, we deform x so the universal covering of this locally symmetric uh, space uh, in, in such a way that it's no longer homogeneous, uh, but still quaternionic Kähler incomplete. So this is the first uh, non-trivial uh, step to do this. Uh, and then uh, we want to do this in a very controlled way. So it should not destroy everything, but we want to keep a big uh, group of symmetries. So of course we will not insist on uh, obtaining homogeneous space. In fact, it will not be homogeneous, but it should still have a rather large a group of isometries such that uh, this group um, G, I call it here, uh, admits a lattice. So this means that there's a discrete subgroup of G such as G mod gamma dev uh, is compact. So, so this is a hope. For a moment, it's just a hope. Whether we can do all this, we will see. Uh, and uh, so by large, I mean, for instance, that the group G acts with cohomogeneity one, so that the orbits will be hypersurfaces, so that this is certainly a large group if you can do this. And the uh, orbit space uh, uh, will be a line, so one, one dimensional, uh, isomorphic to a real line. And uh, we, um, yeah, here in the previous uh, uh, item, uh, when I speak of a lattice, I just mean the G mod gamma is a finite volume, but of course there are also co-compact, uh, uh, you can consider co-compact lattices. This is what I'm doing here in this last step. And if, it, if this lattice uh, gamma def is not only of co-finite volume, but it's really co-compact, uh, then we obtain a manifold uh, with two, uh, two uh, ends. It will be something like 
like this topologically. And then the last step in this program uh, will be to compute the volume of these uh, ends. Okay, so this is the outline of the construction and it's also more or less the outline of the talk. And now I go through the different steps and you will see that in each step, everything is absolutely explicit and concrete. So there will be not, nothing uh, hidden in some uh, uh, constructions. It's all, it all can be made uh, explicit. Okay, so here's the initial uh, quaternionic Taylor symmetric space with which we start. Of course, there are many others. Uh, but this is the one for which we managed to solve all these problems. So uh, we consider SU 2 comma N uh, divided by maximal compact subgroup. So this is the symmetric space, which is dual to the symmetric space of, uh, which is the Grassmannian of complex two planes. This is one of the compact symmetric spaces, and this is the non-compact dual. It's well known, uh, in fact, by, by at least in the physics community, <laughs> it's well known that uh, this space and uh, also the other uh, quaternionic Taylor symmetric spaces, with exception of a quaternionic hyperbolic space, can all be obtained in some uniform way by a construction which is known as the C-map. So this is the cheaper gravity C-map. Uh, this sounds like a buzzword, but it's uh, a completely explicit metric which you can write down uh, for each of these uh, spaces. And um, it's, this metric uh, gives you not only the symmetric space metric, which is of course well known, but it gives you a one parameter deformation of, the, uh, of this metric, which is known as the one loop deformation because it arises uh, in a natural way in string theory as a perturbative quantum correction to the metric. Uh, this is not important for us. It's only important that it is an explicit metric. You can check that it is a metric and can check its properties. Okay, and so let me summarize some of the properties. So this is due to uh, this one loop deformation has been formulated in general for these uh, CMAP spaces in a paper by Robles Jana, Sauer, Essig, and Van Doren, so a group of uh, famous physicists uh, who published in, in j in 2006. Okay. Uh, so this is of course very interesting for us, but uh, if as mathematicians, it can be very hard simply already to verify that some explicitly given metric is quaternionic Kähler and understand why it should be. So it can be hard. And for this reason, we have spent quite a lot of time in uh, obtaining a geometric construction, which proves that this CMAP metric and also its one loop deformation is always quaternionic Kähler. And uh, this is a, a construction which I could go into uh, detail, but perhaps it's just good to know that there is some uh, uh, rigorous derivation of this uh, metric uh, starting from some uh, concretely given initial data. So by initial data, I mean some geometric structures. Uh, in fact, it goes under the name projected special Kähler structure, which is a certain type of Kähler uh, metric together with additional uh, data. And from these data, one can cook up, first of all, a, a pseudo hyper Kähler uh, manifold, so it would be not positive definite, but uh, would be an indefinite uh, hyperkähler manifold, uh, which admits a uh, killing field with some properties uh, such that you can apply some construction which we have developed in these papers, which is the generalization of Heide's HKQK correspondence. So Heide uh, uh, introduced uh, this idea in the setting of positive definite hyperkähler manifolds. And so we spent quite a lot of time in studying Andre Heide's uh, paper. I think it was more than one semester just studying uh, his paper. And then we came up with certain generalizations and uh, we could elaborate on his construction in particular, obtain some explicit metrics, uh, some very explicit formulas for the metric, which in the end enabled us to compare the um, Heide's HKQK correspondence in this more general setting of indefinite hyperkähler many folds with the original physicist CMAP metric and check that they coincide for appropriate initial uh, geometric data. And so this gives then a proof, not only that the CMAP metric is quaternionic Kähler, which is a result which goes back to Ferrara and Sapaval, but also that this one loop deformation uh, is also quaternionic Kähler. And this is um, very interesting for us because if we apply it to the symmetric space here, and in fact, to any other homogeneous quaternionic Kähler man manifold of negative scalar curvature other than the quaternionic uh, hyperbolic uh, space, and then you obtain such one 
parameter deformation by, uh, by uh, complete quaternionic Taylor manifold. So this is the result joined with Dickmans and Sewer. So we checked that uh, if this the metric is complete, uh, but not for all values of the parameter, only if the parameter is larger or equal to zero. So it depends on the sign of the parameter. In fact, these parameters relate to the Euler number of Calabi Yau uh, manifold in the physics uh, applications when you do all this in string theory, you can sort of modular cases of Calabi Yau manifolds, and it has some topological meaning. But for us, it's just a, a real, it's just a real parameter, and you can check that for, if this parameter is positive, then all is okay, and you get a complete metric. If it is negative, then it's incomplete. Okay, so we will restrict to the complete case. And here is just to illustrate that it's really very explicit and simple, at least in some examples, I consider here the uh, simplest case, uh, n, equal, uh, n equal one. Uh, so um, this corresponds to taking this projective special Kähler manifold, which I mentioned, just the point. So if you take just the point, it's the projective special Kähler manifold, then you get exactly this case. So it's really a simple uh, example. And uh, you see it's an explicit metric. Okay, these coordinates are pe perhaps a bit confusing. These are just real coordinates. They have funny names, but these names are uh, just uh, have some meaning in uh, physics literature and we don't want to keep changing the, the conventions all the time. So these are just real coordinates. The first one is a positive coordinate. In fact, it's called the dilaton. And uh, it's, it can, these coordinates are used to parameterize R four, and uh, we see that all depends on this uh, deformation parameter C. And for C equals zero, we get a symmetric space, which is simply the complex hyperbolic plane. So this is one of the familiar spaces, which you all know. And uh, so what about the uh, deformed space? Can we characterize it in some way? Here's the theorem characterizing the deformed space, at least in this case, n equal one. So these uh, manifolds, uh, which are here, these four dimensional manifolds are the only complete Einstein manifolds with the principal isometric action of the Heisenberg group. So you can characterize it by this property, characterize them by this property. They, this uh, metric has also an interesting name in the physics literature if you want to compare. So this is known the complex hyperbolic space for, for uh, high energy physicists has a name. It is the name is the universal hypermicrobial. So if you tell a high energy physicist about the complex hyperbolic space, perhaps he will not know, but if you say the universal hypermatch bit, then he knows uh, that you are talking about this, uh, this space. And this is the one loop deformation of the universal hypermatch bit. So it's the first uh, such example. Here's the general uh, metric for arbitrary dimension. And it is interesting to study a little bit the structure of this metric. So uh, I hope you are patient enough uh, to uh, listen to me that explaining some of the terms in this metric. So here we see uh, the metric of the complex hyperbolic n minus one space. So uh, we see it comes here with some factor. And in fact, this uh, manifold n bar, uh, you should think more or less as some kind of fibering uh, about this as a kind of fibering over the complex hyperbolic space of dimension n minus one. In fact, if you switch off the deformation constant C, you obtain really a sum uh, of, of the complex hyperbolic metric uh, plus a family of left invariant metrics on the group, which are each of them uh, complex hyperbolic metrics in higher dimensions. Uh, but this family is a non-constant family. It depends on the base point. So this is the stru structure if you take C equal to, um, to uh, uh, zero, and uh, then you switch on the C and you see it, you get some extra terms like this one, uh, which are uh, more complicated uh, terms, uh, which occur for uh, C um, different from zero. But this is, you see, it's a completely explicit metric and you can check everything that this is well defined and you can compute things. Okay, and here for convenience, I have also included the formula for the complex hyperbolic metric in uh, complex coordinates X capital A, just to, to get used to the notation uh, here. So the W's here are complex coordinates, capital X's 
are also complex uh, coordinates. So we have arranged some of the real variables into complex variables to write it in a compact form, which makes sense in all, all dimensions. Okay. Uh, then um, uh, we have found that, so you may argue, okay, you wrote some metric, but how do you know that this metric is a new metric? Perhaps you just use some bad coordinates and it's exactly the symmetric space metric. Okay, so to answer to this question, we have computed a scalar valued curvature invariant. Of course, it's not the scalar curvature because that one is constant for quaternion dynamic scalar manifolds. We use the norm uh, of the curvature tensor. So we computed it for this series and we checked that it is a non-constant whenever this deformation constant is positive. And of course, if it's zero, it, it is a constant. And this proves that the manifold is locally inhomogeneous. So you have no uh, isometric action with an open orbit on this manifold. So it's really uh, a new uh, kind of manifold. Uh, and then we also prove that not only for this space, but for any homogeneous CMAP space, uh, the one loop deformation has still a cohomogeneity one action by a group of isometries. So this is something, some universal group, which always exists. Uh, we call it G. Of course, it depends on the example what, what this group is, but the structure of this group uh, will be um, uh, similar in different cases. And uh, here's the precise information about the group. Uh, so we um, show that this uh, group of isometries, uh, which exists in general for these one loop deformations of homogeneous quaternionic scalar uh, manifolds. Um, has in this case of in the case of the special quaternionic scalar manifold, which was the dual of to the Grassmannian of two planes, a complex Grassmannian of two planes has precisely this structure. So you have some semi-simple part, uh, which is SU1 n minus one. In fact, you take the universal covering uh, of that group and have a semi-direct product with the Heisenberg group in dimension two n plus one. So this is very easy to understand the semi-direct product because the Heisenberg group is constructed out of, out of a symplectic uh, vector space. And uh, this SU, the group SU1 n minus one preserves the symplectic structure. So it will act on the symplectic vector space defining the Heisenberg group and the action extends as an action by automorphism. So this is a semi-direct uh, product, but in fact, for the action on the one loop deformed manifold, you have to take the universal covering and then divide out a diagonally embedded cyclic subgroup. So it's rather funny <laughs> that such structure appears. If you take C equals zero, then it will not be diagonal. So this one loop deformation uh, uh, forces particularly this uh, discrete group Z to sit there, uh, sit inside the semi direct product in a diagonal uh, way. Okay, so this, this is what we uh, found for N larger equal to uh, two. So when this first factor is present, otherwise it will be absent and we don't need to uh, consider it. So this is the, the structure and I will explain a little bit uh, how to describe this group and why it is so it's a, it's a closed subgroup of a full isometry group. So I will also check and uh, explain a little bit how such things can be checked. Okay, so first of all, can we write the, at least the Lie algebra of killing fields of this group? That should be possible. If we know the group, then we should be able to write some uh, vector fields, which are the killing fields. Uh, in, in the Lie algebra of the group. And uh, the, I think the shortest way to list them is, is the following. So we can, first of all, work with complex valued uh, vector fields and they take real and imaginary parts uh, of those. So um, consider these vector fields Y, uh, A. Uh, so um, they, if you take real and imaginary parts of these fields, uh, then they will generate, you can check by computing the commutators of these explicit coordinate expressions that they generate the Lie algebra. And this Lie algebra will be precisely isomorphic to SU1 n minus one. Of course, if you count the fields, these are not enough uh, fields to form a basis. I'm not saying that they form a basis. They generate the algebra. This means you have to take commutators, which will give you new uh, killing fields. And then with these new fields, you get a basis of the algebra. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, you have to take real and imaginary parts of these uh, fields. And then there's also the uh, Heisenberg algebra, and these are the generators of the Heisenberg algebra acting in this coordinate system, which I gave you. And of course, it's a, 
uh, exercise for every student to check that these fields preserve the given metric. So we have to calculate lead derivatives in, uh, of the metric in direction of the process. So this can be easily checked that this result uh, is correct and you can compute the commutators and check the Lie algebra structure. So this gives you this uh, Lie algebra, which is consistent with the group I claimed. And then the question is, what is the group? And of course, if you have a Lie algebra of filling fields acting uh, on a complete uh, Riemannian manifold, then you know that you can, uh, from this, uh, you obtain an induced action of a simply connected uh, Lie group on the manifold. Uh, but this action you have to study. It may not be effective. It can have some discrete uh, effectivity kernel, and you have to study such uh, things. Also, a priori, it may be non closed in the full isometry group. It's also something you have to study. Okay, in fact, there's an additional killing field which has a rather simple uh, form and which allows to extend uh, the algebra G to uh, U1, n minus one semi direct product with a Heisenberg group. But we will not use this extra uh, generator for that reason. I omit omitted in the following, but it's just to mention that it's not all. And in fact, in four dimensions, again, we have checked that this is a full isometry group. So this is a uh, result with Saha and Hung. Um, this is really the full isometry group uh, of the uh, one loop deformed universal hyper multiplet. And uh, so, how we prove that it is uh, close in the full isometry group? So, first of all, the cases when C is zero, the, in, in, this is an undeformed case, and you have just a symmetric space. And of course, you know the isometry group, and you know, no problem to check that this subgroup is closed. Uh, also, in the case uh, n equal one, we have this theorem, which I just mentioned with Saha and Tung, which gives you the full isometry group. So obviously, it's closed in itself. And uh, so the interesting case is uh, in higher dimensions and for C uh, different from for C positive. And uh, there we use a little trick. So instead of acting with the group uh, on the simply connected uh, manifold, which I denoted by n bar for certain reasons we act on a cyclic quotient of n bar so we can divide out um, in fact some central subgroup uh, generated by this element in the center of the heisenberg group so we have the heisenberg group it has the center and we take the this multiple of the uh, uh, yeah so th this element of the center which is a real uh, group r uh, and uh, so this is a um, discrete uh, group, which is in fact the intersection of the images of the semi-simple group and the Heisenberg group under the action on the uh, on the manifold. And this has the advantage that now uh, we have in some sense compactified the center and this uh, makes less trouble. It's easier to understand what happens. Uh, and so we get this quotient n hat, which is just a cyclic quotient of the manifold in bar. And uh, then uh, we have an action of uh, still of the universal covering uh, by isometries of this quotient. And this we call uh, beta hat. And we can study the image of these two factors, semi simple factor in the near radical uh, under the map beta hat. And uh, we um, uh, show that these are closed in the full isometry group of the quotient uh, by showing that they have compact center. And then by some other arguments, we arrive that uh, in the end G is uh, closed. So you cannot, unfortunately, you cannot directly uh, say that, okay, if this, this group uh, here, the image and the beta head uh, of this uh, G tilde is uh, closed in the full isometry group of N hat, it's a priori perhaps not clear that the uh, group uh, G uh, will be closed in the isometry group of the uh, of the universal covering, but we again we use a little trick. We consider the instead of considering the full isometry group, we consider some intermediate group, which is the centralizer of the Heisenberg uh, center in the full isometry group. Uh, and in this way, we can produce the we can describe the group G as a covering of the group uh, beta hat of G hat, of which we already know that it's closed. Uh, in the centralizer of the Heisenberg uh, center. And so we get the same conclusion for the group G. But since the centralizer is closed in the ambient isometry group, uh, we have finally proven uh, that the group G is closed in the full isometry uh, group. So this is a sketch of proof. 
So if you read this in our paper, it's a little longer uh, to explain all this. Uh, yeah, then uh, the main result uh, about the quotients is the following. So, uh, so we have now this group G, which we understand uh, quite in detail. And the claim is that there exist lattices in the group uh, G. So by a lattice, I understand a um, uh, discrete subgroup of cofinite volume. It's not necessarily co-compact. Yeah? Uh, there exist lattices. Uh, such that the quotient of the uh, quaternionic Taylor manifold, this one loop deformed symmetric space, is uh, diffeomorphic to a cylinder R times K, uh, where the fiber K, uh, which depends on T, it's always diffeomorphic to some manifold K, uh, but the volume of this fiber uh, is always finite. It depends on T, but it's always uh, finite. So we get this kind of special uh, structure. And moreover, uh, we can compute the volume of the uh, domain uh, where T is bounded from below or from above. If you bound T from below, so if you consider the part where T goes to infinity, then we find that it has finite volume. So this, this unbounded domain has finite volume, uh, whereas for T going to minus infinity, this other domain, uh, we get infinite volume. The variable T is related to this dilaton, natural dilaton variable by O is, is exponential of uh, t. So this is something we computed. And uh, for n less or equal to 2, this means a quaternion, this means real dimension of the quaternionic manifold is equal to 4 or 8. In these two cases, we even find co-compact lattices as above. So this means that in dimension 4 and 8, uh, we really can construct manifolds with quaternionic Keller manifolds with finite volume n's. Okay, so this is a corollary. We obtain that there exist locally inhomogeneous quaternionic Taylor manifolds complete with an end of finite volume in dimensions four and eight. And uh, as you expect, in dimension four is in fact rather easy to write them down and to write down this discrete uh, group. It will be just a lattice in the Heisenberg group. Uh, and um, uh, to describe it, the construction in, in general, it's convenient to consider uh, this semi-direct product. Uh, so up to coverings, we are exactly considering this uh, semi-direct uh, product, which I call now G bar. So it's exactly the image of the universal covering under the um, homomorphism uh, beta hat. And this acts on the cyclic uh, quotient n hat uh, of our universal covering in bar. And uh, the, this group gamma, this discrete group Gamma, the lattice, which I want to construct, has the structure gamma one, uh, semi gamma one bar, semi direct product uh, uh, gamma two. So, in fact, gamma was a lattice in G, and gamma bar is the corresponding image in G bar. And this image in G bar is the semi direct product of a lattice in the semi simple group, semi direct product with a lattice in the Heisenberg group. So, this is the structure of these discrete groups. So, here's the Simplest example for n equal one, uh, the semi simple factor here goes away. It's trivial, and you are left with a Heisenberg group. And then you can just take a lattice in the three dimensional Heisenberg group, and uh, you obtain a near manifold K and the quaternionic, complete quaternionic Keller manifold with finite volume n, which we have uh, obtained in this case, uh, is just a um, cylinder over a near manifold topologically. So yeah. are, are you saying that this has two ends? So you yes. One end has yes, I'm saying one end has finite volume, the other has infinite volume, definitely. Otherwise, I would have announced the talk as a quaternion Keller manifold of finite volume. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm only claiming that we can construct a complete manifold with one end of finite volume, but the other end will be always of infinite volume in this construction. Uh, here's the construction in eight dimensions. So it's a little bit more involved but but still uh, very um, concrete and explicit so we start with a, a prime number positive prime number b and uh, a, a natural number which is not a square mod uh, b uh, and then we consider the corresponding so-called quaternion algebra so you take the integer span of the uh, identity two by two matrix and of the matrices i j and k where k is the product of i and j uh, and so here i is uh, okay, uh, square root of a times square root of minus one times this two by two matrix, which is 
uh, written here. So the square uh, of this uh, I is A, the square of J is B, and, uh, and then you have here the product that will be minus AB uh, square. And so such type of algebras are called quaternion algebra. So it's not the standard algebra of quaternions, it is some generalization of that notion. And such algebras appear in the theory of Fuchsian groups. So they can be used to construct co-compact uh, lattices in, uh, so acting um, co-compactly on the hyperbolic plane, real hyperbolic uh, plane. And so that's the natural uh, context in which such quaternion algebras uh, appear. And then the claim is that exactly this, um, uh, this quaternion algebra, when you intersect it with our group SU11, SU1, comma uh, 1, uh, then uh, you get a co-compact uh, Fuchsian group, uh, which moreover uh, preserves the uh, lattice in the, Heisen, in the five dimensional Heisenberg group. And this lattice is obtained by applying uh, this um, uh, algebra to uh, the basis vector, to one of the two basis vectors of C2, to the vector one zero. In this way, you obtain four uh, independent uh, real uh, vectors and they uh, generate uh, a lattice in the Heisenberg uh, group. And moreover, uh, in this setting, we um, choose the, uh, this one loop parameter in a special way. We choose it to be a rational multiple of square root of AB over pi in such a way that all of this is consistent with the cyclic quotient which we are considering to avoid some dense uh, subgroup in that, that circle. Uh, so this can be also done. And then uh, the, the lattices which we finally obtain are exactly semi-direct product of this any of these lattices in this family, which depends on these parameters A and B uh, with any, uh, uh, yeah, with this corresponding lattice gamma two in the Heisenberg uh, group. And uh, that's it up to a finite index normal subgroup. So you have to allow finite index normal subgroup to get the free uh, action on the hyperbolic uh, plane. Uh, okay, so these are the eight dimensional uh, examples. And in arbitrary uh, dimension, we can still construct such lattices, but they will not be uh, co-compact. Uh, so we take lattice in the Heisenberg group, uh, projecting, so it projects uh, to a lattice in the vector parts in the quotient of the Heisenberg group by its center. And uh, then we consider the normalizer of this lattice in SU1 comma in minus one. And by general facts about uh, lattices, this is a lattice. Uh, and then up again, up to passing to finite index normal subgroup, uh, we get again such nice semi-direct uh, product, uh, which defines the quaternionic Taylor manifold with the property that it's diffeomorphic to a product uh, of a real line uh, with a fiber K. Uh, and this fiber has for each time T has finite uh, volume and moreover, it not only has finite volume, but the union of all these fibers, uh, for values of the parameter larger than some lower bound uh, has uh, finite volume. Okay, so this is, this is the uh, result. Uh, so here are the volume computation. So if you are interested in understanding how the volume goes to infinity, uh, this is uh, interesting. And also I can explain a little bit how we obtain this because a priori it looks very complicated. You have a very complicated metric how to compute the volume, but the good thing is that we have a cohomogeneity one uh, group. And so this, and for that reason, uh, we can manage to split off the volume density as some invariant uh, factor. So which is invariant under this cohomogeneity one uh, group times some factor, which depends uh, only on rho. And for fixed C, it depends only on rho. And then it's sufficient to study the powers here of rho when rho goes to infinity or to zero to understand whether the volume stays finite or infinite. So it's rather at that stage, it's then not uh, so difficult anymore to compute this. So for instance, we see that from this formula for the uh, volume density, which is completely uh, general, uh, we obtain that the volume of the domain where the, the stylatonic variable is bounded from uh, below uh, goes like uh, one over rho zero to the power n plus one for uh, rho zero to infinity. So this, this is the end which is uh, which has a finite volume. So this is the finite volume end, and for the other end, uh, we will find 
infinite volume. So this is again the same formula, <laughs> not to change anything. Uh, so here we get two cases. Now it depends on whether C is zero or not, because if uh, C is zero, you get different asymptotics and for C different from zero. So in the case C equals zero, so this is a symmetric space, we get this type of asymptotics. And uh, for the uh, non-symmetric case, we get a different power here. So some jump in the, in the behavior of this uh, volume. Okay, so that's about it, about the results joined with um, uh, Danu Tung and Markus Röser. So these are our results so far. And then I would like to give an outlook. I'm, I'm not sure about the time, how much time I have. Um, yeah, I have still a little bit of time, yeah. Okay, so, so I would like to give you an outlook about open problems and what you can do next and, and some of these things you have already started. So, uh, one question is, uh, what about other symmetric spaces? So here we have considered a very particular symmetric space. There's another uh, series, uh, infinite series of quaternionic Kähler symmetric spaces of non-compact type, which is this one. And so it would be natural to uh, study the same kind of questions for this series. We have not yet done it. Uh, so there's a PhD student who has started now looking at, the, uh, at this uh, series, uh, Alejandro Garcia. So this is something uh, which we want to look at. And uh, so the expectation is again that we will get uh, a construction of quaternionic Kähler uh, manifolds, complete ones, uh, with a fundamental group of the type gamma one semi-direct product with gamma two, uh, where gamma two is again a lattice in the Heisenberg group, but gamma one is now a lattice in a different semi-simple group. In fact, this is the conjecture that this will be always of this uh, type for any uh, symmetric space, which is quaternionic Kähler when you apply the one loop deformation. So there's a certain semi-simple group, which is known. So it's, we, we know the group. And uh, so uh, we expect that we will get similar results uh, with the lattice in this semi-simple group S for other symmetric space, for, for all other symmetric spaces uh, with exception of quaternionic hyperbolic space. And in this example, for instance, the semi-simple group will, would be this one. So it's, it's a product. It's not a, not a simple group for that series. And uh, it's reasonable to expect that, again, the volume uh, of the domain where rho is larger than rho zero uh, will be finite. So it's something which, uh, we expect, but we have not computed this yet. Yeah, perhaps one comment. So the case which we did where we computed uh, curvature and scalar curvature invariant and uh, many other things, uh, it was particularly simple for the following reason. So when you uh, consider this case from the perspective of this uh, supergravity C map, then it's um, a privileged case because you start from a, a hyperbolic, complex hyperbolic space. Why, why is this privileged? In complex hyperbolic space can be uh, considered as a projective special scalar manifold, so projective in sense of physics. It's, it's, it's not of algebraic geometry. It's projective versus affine. Um, is the, the dichotomy. So it can be considered as the base uh, of a Kähler cone, which is in fact an example of a conical affine special Kähler manifold. And in that example, that conical affine special Kähler manifold is a flat one. And the Levi Civita connection coincides with the so called special connection, which is a flat connection which you have in this special affine special Kähler geometry. And that's the reason why we were able, uh, so using the flatness of this uh, conical affine special Kähler manifold, to really do the comp computations because then the when you consider the cotangent bundle of that one uh, you get an indefinite hypertaylor manifold which is again flat and uh, so on that side everything is easy and when you transform all to the quaternionic Kähler side you're at least able to obtain some formula for the uh, curvature uh, but and, and to see from the formula that the scalar curvature invariant which we computed is non-constant this will be harder for other uh, cases with high dimensional uh, examples, but nevertheless, there's some hope after this experience that one can do such uh, calculations uh, in other cases. Okay, the co compactness of the lattice in the semi simple group is, of course, not granted, but it might be true in some special examples. So it's related to this open question whether there exist complete quaternionic Kähler manifolds of dimension larger or equal to 12 with a finite volume. And that are not locally symmetric. So we will solve this only 
until dimension eight for dimension 12, we don't know at the moment. And there's another question, which is much more speculative. It's a bit in the spirit of some of the talks we had uh, where uh, we have some inspiration from high energy uh, physics. In fact, one may ask whether it's possible to use non-perturbative quantum corrections to these quaternionic Keller metrics, so which have their origin in string theory, these corrections to construct complete quaternionic Keller manifolds of finite volume. So this uh, dream would be that uh, we have this perturbative correction. Okay, it has some nice properties, this finite volume end, but perhaps adding some more corrections, which are no longer of perturbative uh, nature, but non-perturbative nature, uh, we may be able to uh, construct examples of finite volume. In fact, physicists expect this. I think it's very hard. It's a very hard uh, question. It's not at all uh, clear if this will be successful, but it's, uh, it's expected. Uh, uh, in fact, before, before I mention here state of the art, um, uh, this is expected within the context of a, a large activity in physics, which is known under the name swampland. So you may have heard there's a swampland, there are these swampland distance conjectures, and this, these are related to some constraints on the effective uh, and the effective field theory derived as a low energy limit of uh, string theory. Uh, to, so some conditions for such theory to be consistent uh, with a consistent theory of quantum gravity. And uh, one of the conjectures in that uh, context, so Uguri uh, Bafa and other people have made uh, conjectures in that setting. One of the conjectures is that the resulting manifold fold, uh, should be always of finite volume. But so far, no example. <laughs> It's known, but that's the conjecture. So if we believe the expectation of a physicist, and my experience shows that physicists are usually right <laughs> with, uh, when they claim uh, something, even if you don't understand the proof sometimes, uh, usually uh, they are right uh, with the expectation. So there's perhaps some reason to uh, expect uh, that if you perhaps in some future when everything is well, better understood, one can make this work and obtain even some finite volume uh, metrics. On the other hand, the structure of these instanton corrections is extremely complicated. So authors who have studied this are Alexander Fiolini and others. So the problem already starts with the definition of a metric. So even the metric is not defined. So there are some divergences even in the, I mean, before studying some properties of the metric, you need the metric and it has not been defined in general for these instanton corrections which appear uh, in string theory, but uh, there are special cases uh, where we have a rigorously defined metric. And so one such case is uh, known as the case of uh, mutually local variations of BPS structures. So in this mutually local case, this has to do with electric and magnetic charges so that you can polarize everything, just consider only electric or only magnetic. Charges. So in that setting, uh, at least we have managed to define rigorously the metric using some uh, new approach to this metric. And this builds on the work of Alexandrov and uh, Banerjee, who have used the different uh, methods. In fact, they use what is called projective superspace and the twister methods. But you know all that in the twister theory, there are some mathematical conditions to be checked. And it's not, it's not that it works per se. So you have many things, you have to check many things and it's not so trivial, but we have managed to construct the metric uh, explicitly without any twister theory. So we can really work out the metric and check that it's well-defined. So we have conditions for convergence of all uh, infinite sums. And I will show you the metric in a moment. It's just to, for illustration, I will not comment much. So this is work with Ivan uh, Tully. So the uh, result is that in particular, the quaternionic Keller manifolds, which I have shown you, uh, they can be still be formed by including these non-perturbative quantum corrections associated with these uh, mutually local variations of hot structures, at least in the neighborhood of rho equal infinity. So I'm not claiming that we can uh, deform them everywhere. I think it's a similar problem uh, as was discussed uh, in, in Lorenzo's uh, talk, what is the domain of definition of the metric? So we, the domain is in a neighborhood of rho equal infinity. And at the moment, it's, it's not clear whether you can extend this to complete uh, metrics. That's, that's not at all clear and less clear whether the volume would be finite. Okay, so we don't know. 
whether the metric can be extended to a complete quaternion Kähler metric or when it can be extended for which type under which type of conditions. But our construction is rather flexible. So you have many possible choices for these variations of DPS structures. So there's some flexibility. And uh, yeah, this is something I mentioned in connection with this home plan distance conjecture that it's expected that the, that the volume becomes finite if you include all uh, corrections predicted by uh, string theory and if the um, many this Riemannian manifold is consistent with the coupling uh, to gravity at the quantum level, whatever that, that means. So that's the conjecture. If everything is consistent, then it should be a finite volume. And if you have included all what, uh, what is there in nature, all possible uh, infantron corrections, it's not sufficient to include only perturbative corrections. Yeah, if we have, I'm, I'm not sure about the time. So I have here also some definition of some of the objects which appear. So just for illustration, I will, this is not the topic of today's talk, but just to give you an idea of what kind of structures appear here. Um, so what is this variation of DPS structure on which uh, the deformation, uh, these non-perturbative deformations um, depend? So we, we consider a complex manifold and a variation of DPS structure uh, is a bunch of data, lambda, z, and omega. So lambda is a local system of lattices uh, with some constant uh, skew symmetric integer valued uh, pairing. So you have kind of symplectic space, but over the integers, uh, or you can say you have a symplectic vector bundle with flat connection with, with uh, integer, such that the holonomy preserves the lattice. Uh, and then you have a holomorphic uh, section of the complexified uh, of, of the bundle you obtain by complexification uh, and uh, uh, and a function defined on this bundle of lattices uh, lambda and this is for the moment is just a function of sets so for every uh, gamma you, you have some uh, integer and the value on gamma should be the same then on minus gamma, and there's a, a famous conservative sobelman work crossing formula, uh, which expresses the behavior of this omega. For us, it's completely irrelevant because we are in mutually local case, and then we don't need the conservative sobelman work crossing formula, which is part of the very complicated structure which appears here. So we are switching off this uh, part of the complication. And uh, the, the benefit which we have is that we can define a metric which is well defined in that setting. And there are some technical conditions which are needed in the end to prove that you really get, get the metric. Uh, so there, there's a support uh, property. So for every element in the lattice, which is in the support of this function, uh, omega, you have some estimate. So there's some constant uh, and you can bound the value of this section on a charge gamma from below by uh, some constant times the norm of gamma. So this is some parallel norm in the lattice. And uh, you have also some uh, statement that you have normal convergence for the sum of omega gamma with some exponentially uh, suppressing factors here. So these are, you see, it's not very complicated technical conditions. So the, we have really eliminated the most complicated part, which is uh, related to wall crossing. So we do not consider this here. And mutually local means that uh, uh, whenever um, uh, you have two um, elements, these are called charges. Whenever you have two such charges in the support of uh, omega, then the symplectic pairing between gamma and gamma prime is automatically zero. And it can be shown that this implies that you can find the basis of the lattice, uh, which is Dabu uh, basis, such that the support is totally contained in one half, in momenta or according to uh, Okay, so this mutual locality implies that this set, uh, in fact, there's a notion of walls of marginal stability in this uh, context of a wall crossing. Uh, but the condition which we impose here of mutual locality implies that this set is empty. So there are no walls and therefore no wall crossing. And then the only remnant of the wall crossing formula is that the omega of gamma is a constant function whenever you evaluate it on a, a, local, on a local section uh, of the lattice. So just uh, this statement that it is uh, constant. There's no, no jumping along walls because there are no walls. 
And in our setting, uh, this BPS structure, which looks very general, uh, is very concrete. So it's not, not uh, uh, completely general BPS structure. So we consider a conical affine special Taylor manifold. And uh, this lambda is a nabla parallel lattice, where nabla is the flat connection of a, of a conical affine special Taylor manifold. So it's a very particular kind of uh, such local system. And Z is what is called a Calarian Lagrangian immersion in this description of uh, special Taylor manifolds, or more precisely here, Calarian Lagrangian section. So this means that if you consider this Z as a map from M into this symplectic uh, vector space with flat connection, uh, the image will be Lagrangian, and uh, you have also some constant uh, metric and real structure on the bundle, and this induce a uh, Kähler uh, metric on this Lagrangian uh, on this Lagrangian cone. In fact, in our uh, setting, because we are conical affine special Kähler manifold, so this is the type of data here. And here, just for illustration. <laughs> is the formula uh, for the metric, uh, just to demonstrate that it's explicit. So uh, it fits it basically, I mean, the metric fits in half a page, at least in this uh, tiny <laughs> script size. Uh, <laughs> it fits in half a page, and but then you need to explain the, uh, the objects which appear in the formula, and this requires another one and a half uh, or one page, say. <laughs> And I mean, I will not start. It's, it has no sense to start explaining this. This would be a separate uh, talk, just to give you a flavor of what kind of uh, expressions appear there. Yes. One finite volume. volume. Yeah. At, the At the other end, end so, so before you perform, we turn on this uh, C parameter. Um, you have a, a, a CR, a CR mm -hmm. uh, where two directions on the basis. When you, when you turn, turn on, uh, on C, C, what happens, happens to the structure of that type of uh, Yeah, I think, yeah, it is some time ago that we uh, looked at this, but um, we found that there's like a, a jump in this conformal structure. So it acquires a singularity. So instantaneously. So when you switch on this uh, C, uh, then you have a diff different asymptotics. Right. right. But, but, uh, what, what, so when so you just look, look at, the, uh, at that, at that in, your, in some of your work, one, one way that you'd be able to represent it with hyperplane infinity. Mm -hmm. it, it, does it, does it, what is its structure? Does it have a conformal structure or does it have a CR structure? No, I think this example is a bit like a mix. This is like an interpolation between the complex hyperbolic plane and the real for uh, hyperbolic four space. Right. So, so there, 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 uh, uh, Henry Kennedy's here wrote down a very nice hyperplane where for uh, all of uh, one. one uh, so, so, so if you think of this as one run run map, complete self conscious one run map from four ball, where one parameter where it generates like a CR structure, and the other one is like a couple of other barriers, on the three CR. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, this family is, of course, different from the Peterson metric. They have some similarities. Uh, here we have this uh, Heisenberg. Uh, group acting by a cohomogeneity one, I think, in Peterson is like uh, SU2, uh, so SU2 group. So it's a different setting. But I mean, these questions can be uh, side only that I don't know them on the top of my head now, uh, the precise form. But we have uh, looked at this in a paper with Apan uh, Saha, uh, what happens to the conformal uh, structure. So it depends a bit whether you consider it in the limit where uh, everything looks like the real hyperbolic space or when you compare with the complex hyperbolic space. Okay. So, so in, 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 in thinking about, about uh, 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 you, you also, also mentioned, mentioned this other uh, series, series of metric spaces, S and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, 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 actually, one of my first three papers on that, I looked at that series. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the, uh, uh, the some kind of explanation of that series, the problem is that it's never clear whether they think that the three C is going to be two. So, if they turn down that, for example, they say, 
if they make a picture of that, if you have a red sea on your free land, or a red sea on your free land, there's an associated statement that started with half a mile by the cost of the space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that will go over to the And so what I found is that we put it on our market to perform the formal structure of the website. Our market for that is really a structure. And all these tasks associated with the problem is that. Yeah, but I think these examples are a little, little different because the conformist structure is destroyed. So when you switch on the parameter, you have no conformist structure. It will be singular. So I know that. that, that we're, I mean, on the three sphere, you have a, for, for the ball, you have a conformist no, structure no, no, on the no, three no, sphere. No, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so, um, so, so, but then this is just general higher. Yeah. 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 So, the, 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 uh, since you have to do with looking at that, Yes, yes, no, I, I'm aware of your uh, paper of this uh, construction of uh, quaternion Keller manifolds. And I, I know you have several, several papers, one in which you do the general construction starting from this uh, indefinite conformal uh, structures, but without uh, studying the completeness of the resulting matrix. And then there's this uh, paper on the uh, quaternionic hyperbolic space where everything works out uh, yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, yes. I mean, it is certainly a very interesting uh, problem, but I'm not completely sure that th these type of deformations will fit in, the, in that context. And I think it's probably that due to the singularity, you get some singularity, instantaneous singularity at infinity once you switch on this uh, factor. In fact, perhaps an interesting remark is that you may wonder what uh, can we say about this parameter C? So is, is it a family of metrics? In fact, it, all these metrics are uh, pairwise isometric for positive parameter. So I mean, there are only two, if you consider C equals zero or C positive, there are only two isometry types. So it's not uh, changing in a continuous way, it's a jump. Mm -hmm. And so I think perhaps for this reason, it's not, it will not completely fit in, in, in this setting. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, no, we, we have complex structure, uh, um, in, but it is not part of the quaternionic uh, structure in, in the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. And you say this can be decided by looking at the Petrov type of the white tensor. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, but we have we have computed uh, uh, curvature tensor. So from the, that computation, we can read off. And only we have not looked from this perspective of the Petrov classification. Yes, I think it, it can be decided. Mm -hmm. no. no, but we have computed the curvature tensor, so we have it uh, explicitly. So from this, we, we, we can we can we can decide this. Yeah, yeah. 